Hi everyone, in this video we will be going through the nomenclature for inorganic substances. Here is our syllabus stop point. In the context of chemistry, an organic substance is one which contains carbon to hydrogen bonds, and thus an inorganic substance is one which does not contain carbon to hydrogen bonds. On the right we can see the compound methane, CH4, which consists of four carbon to hydrogen bonds, and thus is considered to be an organic compound. Carbon dioxide, however, whilst containing carbon, is not considered to be an organic compound because its bonds are not carbon to hydrogen bonds. Inorganic substances are pure substances and they can be broken down into different subclassifications, including ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Metals are examples of pure substances. We describe metals to be in their elemental forms when they have not been combined. The names of pure metals are simply the ones that are named as on the periodic table, so for example, Iron, gold, and copper are all names given to the metals uncombined in the periodic table. Molecular substances are pure substances and can be divided into two groups, either the elemental form or the compound form. Here's an example of an element oxygen and the compound water. Molecular substances which are in elemental form are naturally existing elements. They consist of diatomic molecules as well as the monatomic noble gases. Molecular substances which are in elemental form are simply named by the element name that's provided again on the periodic table. So for the monatomic noble gases, helium is simply helium, neon is neon, and argon is argon. Those are the names that are given on the periodic table. Diatomic molecules in elemental forms such as O2, H2, and N2 are given the names oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen respectively. It is important to note, however, that the official names for diatomic substances may be different. So for example, H2, the official name is actually dihydrogen. But the reason why they are generally known simply as the elemental names is because these diatomic forms are their most abundant allotropes. For example, oxygen, which exists mostly as O2, can also exist as O3, which is a compound that's called ozone. Covalent compounds are compounds consisting of atoms that contain two or more elements which are sharing electrons. Usually, they will consist of the sharing between two or more non-metals. Although some exceptions do exist, we will not be discussing that for the purpose of the New South Wales Agency Chemistry Syllabus. When we are naming covalent compounds, prefixes are required to denote the number of atoms of each element. These prefixes are mono for 1, di for 2, tri for 3, tetra for 4, penta for 5, hexa for 6, hepta for 7, octa for 8, nono for 9, and deca for 10. The naming conventions for covalent substances are as follows. First, the least electronegative element name is named first. In the covalent compound, if there is only one atom of the first element, we do not need to include the mono prefix and it is omitted for the first element. Next, the second element's ending is modified to ide. This is important to note as not all elements end in ein, so sometimes, for example, like oxygen, we will change the gen part of oxygen into ide. It's important also to consider that the final vowel of the prefix is omitted if the element name begins on that vowel. So let's look at an example. Here we have monooxide. Remember I mentioned that oxygen would change the ending into an ide. First of all, because the element begins on the vowel O, the final vowel of that prefix is omitted. So rather than monooxide, it would become monoxide. And instead of tetraoxide, it would become tetroxide. Here are some examples demonstrating the steps that we would take to name different compounds. Here is our first compound. There is one carbon and one oxygen. Because carbon is the least electronegative element, we will name it first. The name begins with carbon and oxygen. After this, we need to include the prefixes which indicate how many of each of the elements there are. Because there is one carbon and one oxygen, it becomes monocarbon monoxide. Because the first element is a singular carbon, we can now omit the mono prefix as now the final name is simply going to be carbon monoxide. In this next example, we have two hydrogens and one oxygen. Hydrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, so we begin the name with hydrogen, then oxygen. There are two hydrogens, so it is dihydrogen, and since there is one oxygen, it becomes monoxide. This is the official name of the molecule, but sometimes substances can have common names that do not abide by the IU Pact and Meglisher conventions. So actually, this compound is simply named water. For this next example, we have a compound which contains nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, so the nomenclature begins with nitrogen, then oxygen. Since there are two nitrogens and four oxygens, the nomenclature becomes dinitrogen, 
tetroxide. Ionic compounds are a type of compound which consists of ions, cations and anions. These ions are held together by an electrostatic attraction, which is also known as an ionic bond. Ionic compounds are usually composed of a metal cation and a non-metal anion. The structure of an ionic substance can be seen on the right hand side, where the compound is a repeating 3D array of positively charged cations in blue and negatively charged anions in red. These lines indicate the ionic bonds that are formed as a result of the electrostatic attraction between the positive cation and the negative anion. For ionic compound nomenclature, the cation names are named first. Usually the cation of the ionic compound is composed of a metal, and if that metal is a transition metal, then the oxidation state has to be included. And the way that it is done is it is given as a Roman numeral and is also given in parentheses. We will look at an example of what this should be. Note that there should be no space between the transition metal name and the parentheses. The anion name follows, and if it is an anion that is derived from a single element, then the end of the name is again changed to ide, just like we did with our covalent compounds. However, unlike covalent compound nomenclature, it's important to note that no prefixes need to be included to denote the number of each element in the compound. That's why when we look at the example NaCl, rather than calling this monosodium monochloride, it is simply sodium chloride. Fe2O3 is iron 3 oxide because Fe is a transition metal and the oxidation state of the Fe is 3. There is no space between the ending letter of the element and the parentheses. We will look at a few examples to see how we implement these nomenclature rules to name ionic compounds. Here we have the elements sodium and chlorine. Since sodium is the cation and chlorine is the anion, we order the names so that sodium is first and chlorine is second. The cation is named first as sodium, and we do not need to include any prefix to indicate the number of elements. Then the anion is chlorine, and we modify the ending to ide, so now it is sodium chloride. And the empirical formula for this compound is NaCl, as in order to have a neutral compound, we need to have a 1 to 1 ratio of sodium and chloride ions to cancel out the charges. Next we have the elements magnesium and chlorine. Since magnesium is the cation and chlorine is the anion, we order the name so that magnesium is first and chlorine is second. The cation is named first as magnesium, then the anion is chlorine with the ending modified so that it is now chloride. Notice that this time the empirical formula of the ionic compound is actually going to be MgCl2. The reason why we have this 2 is because there are two chlorines or two chloride ions that are required to neutralize the 2 plus charge of the magnesium ion. Again, we do not need to indicate the number of elements in the ionic compound using the mono, di, or tri prefixes. For this example, we have potassium and oxygen. Because potassium is the cation and oxygen is the anion, we name first potassium, then oxygen. Remembering our rule, we will alter and modify the ending of the oxygen to turn it into oxide. And finally, we will work out the empirical formula, which is going to be K2O. And the reason why it is K2O is because we require two single 1 plus charges in order to neutralize the 2 minus charge of the oxide ion. For this example we now have iron 2 plus and oxygen. The cation is iron and the anion is oxygen, so we begin the name as iron then oxygen. However now we need to consider that iron is a transition metal. Transition metals require us to indicate the oxidation state of the ion by including it in parentheses and roman numerals. The name is thus iron 2 oxide with the ending of oxygen being modified to ide. And the final empirical formula of this is FeO as there is a 1 to 1 ratio of iron cations and oxygen anions to neutralize their charges. If you are unsure, it is important to note that the oxidation state of the iron is equal to what the charge of the iron ion is. Here we can do some example questions. The first question asks, what is the name of a compound with the formula CO2? Our first step is to identify whether or not this is ionic or covalent. Because the compound consists of only non-metals, we can safely assume that this is likely to be a covalent compound. What this now allows us to do is decide which set of nomenclature rules we are going to utilize in order to name this compound. Using our rule, first, the least electronegative element is carbon, so the naming order becomes carbon, then oxygen. We have one carbon and two oxygens, so now the name is going to be monocarbon and it's going to be dioxygen. But we need to remember that we need to modify the ending of the second element into an ide. So it is now monocarbon dioxide. And finally, we do not need to indicate the motto if it is the first element of the compound. So that means this compound is called carbon dioxide. The next compound is CaF2. 
This time, this is an ionic compound because it contains the metal calcium and the non-metals fluorine. The cation that is formed is calcium, and so the anion is fluorine, and we write the name in order calcium fluorine. Since this is an ionic compound, we need to modify the ending of the anion of fluorine to fluoride. And finally, the compound name is calcium fluoride. We do not need to identify the number of elements in this compound because it is an ionic compound. This element consists of phosphorus and oxygen. Both of these elements are non-metals, so this is a covalent compound. Phosphorus is less electronegative than oxygen, so it is named first in the order of phosphorus and oxygen. There are two phosphorus atoms and five oxygen atoms, so we need to name this as diphosphorus and then pentoxide, remembering that we had to change the ending of oxygen into ide. Here we have an ionic compound as it consists of iron, and which is a transition metal, and chlorine, which is a non-metal. Because in this example we have a transition metal, we need to make sure that we indicate the oxidation state by using Roman numerals in parentheses. The naming order is going to be iron, then chlorine, as iron is the cation and chlorine is the anion. Now we need to alter the ending of chlorine to chloride and then determine what the oxidation state of iron is going to be. Since there are three chloride anions for each one Fe iron cation, to balance a charge of three times minus one, which is a total of minus three, the charge of the iron cation must be plus three, and thus the name of this is iron, 3 in parentheses chloride. Note that there is no space between the end of the iron and the parentheses. For these questions, we are now determining the molecular formulae given a compound's nomenclature. Carbon tetrachloride is going to be a covalent substance since there are no metal substances. Since there is no prefix for carbon, that indicates that there is one carbon, and the tetra indicates that there are four chlorines. So that means that this is going to have a molecular formula of CCl4. For the next question, we are now determining what is the empirical formula for the compound sodium sulfide. The question hints that this might be an ionic substance which is confirmed when we consider that sodium is a metal and sulfur is a non-metal. For ionic substances, we need to determine what the ionic charges of the cation and anion would be to work out their ratios as the mono, di, tri prefixes are not used. Sodium is a group 1 metal, meaning that the cation that would be formed would be Na+. Sometimes students may be confused with the second part of the name and be unsure as to whether this refers to the single element sulfur or to the polyatomic ion sulfate. We know that this must indicate the singular element sulfur because the Na has been modified to Ide, which is a rule that is only used for when there are single element anions. Sulfur is a group 16 element. This means that it has a total of 6 valence electrons and thus has a valency of minus 2, so the charge of sulfur would be 2 minus. In order for this minus 2 charge to be neutralized by the plus 1 charge of sodium, there must be a total of 2 sodium atoms for every 1 sulfide atom. This makes the empirical formula for this compound Na2S. For our final example, we are finding the empirical formula for the compound copper 2 iodide. This is an ionic substance because it contains both a transition metal copper and a non-metal iodine. The cation is copper as it has been named first and the anion is the iodide anion. The charge of copper is 2 plus since it has an oxidation state of 2, indicated by the parentheses, and the charge of the iodide ion is minus 1, as iodine is a group 17 halogen and has a valency of 1 minus. To balance the charge of these anions, there must be a ratio of 2 iodides for every 1 copper cation, and so the empirical formula must be CuI2. And that concludes the video on inorganic compound nomenclature. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.